Today we're going to look at the Leibniz Integral Rule, which is really one of the main parts of the Internet's favorite integral trick, which is Feynman's integral trick of taking the derivative inside of the integral. This can also be seen as some sort of generalization or extension of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So in particular, we want to find some formula for the derivative with respect to x of the integral from a of x to b of x, so those bounds are functions of x, of f of x t dt. So that function in there is a function of x and t. Now observe that if this function inside of the integral was only a function of t, then this would be much closer to the fundamental theorem of calculus. In fact, you could find that derivative using that fundamental theorem of calculus along with the chain rule. Okay, so anyway, let's get to our derivation of this rule, and I'll just put the whole statement on the screen right now so that you can see the hypotheses if you're interested. So let's set capital F of X equal to, well, that integral that we want to differentiate which means our goal is in fact to find f prime of x. And we'll set that up with the limit definition of the derivative. So we need to do the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. But now quickly that turns into the following type of object. So we have this limit as h goes to zero of the integral from a of x plus h to b of x plus h of f of x plus h comma t dt. So that's our capital f of x plus h. And then we have minus the integral from a of x to b of x of f of x t dt. And then, well, that's all over h. Okay, great. But now what I'd like to do is really see how this first integral can be decomposed into simpler parts. So let's maybe underline this in green and we'll bring that over here. And what I really want to maybe explore here is what we can do with the bounds of integration. So here we're just looking at what's happening with a of x plus h to b of x plus h, those bounds of integration. And we'll just put kind of anything in here at the moment. So let's observe that we can split this up into three pieces. Maybe the integral from a of x plus h up to a of x, plus the integral from a of x to b of x, and then plus the integral from b of x up to b of x plus h. So now let's keep that in mind. And what we'd like to do is push this decomposition of that first integral into our limit. And then maybe simultaneously, let's observe that this middle integral in our decomposition matches the bounds of integration that we have over here for well, this other part of our limit definition of our derivative. So let's see. We can put those together and we'll have the limit as h goes to zero. I'm going to write a one over h out front. And then we'll have our integral from a of x to b of x of f of x plus h minus, sorry, f of x plus h comma t minus f of x comma t and then d and then, well, of course, we've got everything connected to the rest of this stuff as well. And, well, what I'm going to do now is, well, bring that stuff down, but then also swap the bounds of integration of this a of x plus h term so that the a of x plus h is on top, but that can be done just by introducing a minus. So now we'll have our integral from b of x up to b of x plus h. And let's see, what's inside of that? It's this thing. So f of x plus h comma t dt. And from that, we'll subtract the integral from a of x to a of x plus h of 
our f of x plus h comma t and then that's dt and then all of that is in parentheses okay so i think that's looking pretty good and now maybe as we move this to the top of the next board what i'll do is i'll bring this one over h inside of this first integral and then also distribute it through to those next terms and i'm also going to split this limit into two limits or perhaps three limits one for this first integral and then one for those uh, second or two for those second two integrals and i guess i should say here we're allowed to do this because we're assuming that the hypotheses of this theorem, which is the Leibniz integral rule, are satisfied. Okay, so let's get to doing that. Okay, so this is where we left ourselves off, and, well, as I said, we split this into three integrals. And now, well, let's focus on this first one. We have the limit as h goes to zero, and then an integral from a of x to b of x, and then we've got f of x plus h comma t minus f of x comma t over h. But now observe, if we bring that limit inside, which again, we're allowed to do, um, we'll have simply the derivative of f with respect to x inside of that integral. It's just the limit definition of that partial derivative. So let's maybe rewrite that first integral as such. So here we have our integral from a of x up to b of x, and then the partial of f with respect to x and then I'll just point out that this is a function of x and t. And then we have dt there. Okay, so I think that's a good place to start this last bit of our calculation. Now let's see what we can do with the rest of these pieces. So what we'll do here is use something called the mean value theorem for integrals. And uh, if I remember, I'll put that on the screen right now. And we'll do that for this integral that I'm underlining in yellow, and, well, this next integral that I'm underlining in orange. Those are really the same type of integral. It's just maybe one is built out of our function b of x and the other one built out of our function a of x. So let's see, let's bring this limit as h goes to zero down, and then we're gonna have an h in the denominator and then what the mean value theorem for integrals says is that this integral is equal to the length of the interval, which in this case will be b of x plus h minus b of x times the function value at, well, some certain special place. And well, what's that certain special place? Well, it's going to depend on the function and stuff. In fact, the mean value theorem says that there exists a point between these two endpoints that makes the integral equal to, well, simply the length of the interval times that function value. Okay, so anyway, this is going to be equal to f of f of x plus h comma t star, and I'll just put that over here. That's going to be for some t star between, well, what is it going to be between, uh, let's see, b of x and b of x plus h. Now, of course, we don't know which one is larger, b of x or b of x plus h, so that's why we can't write this as an inequality. Okay, cool. So now let's do the same kind of thing for the next part. So that's going to give us minus uh, the limit as h goes to zero of, well now we'll have a of x plus h minus a of x all over h times f of x plus h comma t, maybe double star, so star, star. And then, well, what's t double star? Well, it's the same kind of idea. Well, we're using the same theorem here, so that's going to be for sum t star star between, let's see, a of x and a of x plus h, in this case, because that's our, you know, bounds of integration. OK, 
okay, nice. So now we're ready to really just finish this whole thing off. So let's bring this integral down because that's actually not gonna change between our next to last step and our last step. So let's see, we have that taken care of now. And then let's see what we have for this next limit. So the limit is h goes to zero of this b of x plus h minus b of x over h. That's simply b prime of x. And since b is a function of one variable, I think it's maybe uh, nice just to write that as b prime of x. We don't have to think about a partial derivative or anything. And then, well, let's notice as h goes to zero, this goes to f of x, comma, we'll notice t star being between b of x and b of x plus h is going to get squeezed to being equal to b of x. So this is going to be equal to f of x, comma, b of x. And then, well, something almost exactly is happening inside of that other limit. We'll have minus a prime of x times f of x, comma, a of x. Well, and there you have it. So starting here, or maybe starting way over here with this derivative, we'll see that the derivative with respect to x of this integral has this form over here. Now I'd like to point out that if a and b are constants, we'll simply be left with this first integral here, which is maybe more well known as the Feynman's trick for finding the integral by taking the derivative on the, under the integral sign. But if instead our function inside of the integral only depends on t and not x, well, then this first integral will be zero and we will be left with these second two parts, which is essentially maybe a souped up version of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So I think that's a really nice view of this Leibniz integral rule in its most general form as some sort of fusion of the classic way of writing Feynman's trick with the fundamental theorem of calculus that you learned in a first semester calculus class. And that's a good place to stop.